Let's take our, our a look internationally. And the UN is uh, probably going to go through uh, some changes this year, or at least if uh, if several critics uh, get their way, it will. Uh, Donald Trump promising to shake things up a little bit. Joining us right now is Hillel Neuer. He's a former Montrealer uh, and uh, the uh, director of UN Watch, uh, a group that uh, just does just that, watches the, the, the moves, sometimes the surreal moves by the United Nations. Mr. Neuer, nice to speak to you again. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wanted to have this conversation with you because, of course, it, it should be a pretty um, busy year uh, in terms of activity at the United Nations. C- can we start with Donald Trump and uh, what you believe he will bring to the UN? Uh, will he bring a, a rather confrontational attitude? And, and do you think perhaps uh, shaking things up uh, might be productive? Well, he already has brought a confrontational attitude towards the UN in comments that he's made in the past two to three weeks. Uh, some of them in reaction to the scandalous resolution adopted by the Security Council uh, last week. And he said that things are going to change after January 20th. But the real question is who he names as his ambassadors. It's not clear from his campaign remarks that he has any particular uh, policy outline for what to do at the UN. And the the ambassador that he has named uh, for New York, uh, Nikki Haley, is not someone who's necessarily hard-lined. She's a strong Republican. Uh, but she, but he hasn't yet named, for example, John Bolton to the State Department, who would take a very hard-line approach to the UN. When it comes to uh, some of the recent uh, decisions or, or the way the UN is going to be organized, uh, your tweet from earlier uh, welcoming the new 2017 membership for the UN Human Rights Council, uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, China, Cuba, Iraq, Qatar, Burundi, Bangladesh, and the United Arab Emirates. I'm just off the top of my head, I think there's at least two countries in there that uh, still have a slavery problem. Yeah, it's it's really uh, unbelievable. If, if These are things that one couldn't make up if one wanted to. The membership that's just kicked in this week of the 2017 membership of the Human Rights Council includes some of the worst abusers of women's rights, of children's rights, of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Saudi Arabia is a country where women have no human rights at all, where uh, blogger Raif Badawi, whose wife, Ensa Haider, of course, is in Sherbrooke, Quebec, uh, had to flee. And her husband has been in prison, suffering for, for years now. Uh, and has a, a sentence of 10 years and, and, and of lashes, a thousand lashes, 50 of which he's received for the crime of being a blogger calling for democracy in Saudi Arabia. They are now a member, as they have been before, and Venezuela is a country which has caused mass starvation, where the opposition leaders like Leopoldo Lopez and Mayor Antonio Ledesma of Caracas have been thrown into prison. China, where Liu Xiaobo, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, is is in prison, and where one billion three hundred million people have no freedom of, of speech, religion, association. All of these countries and other regimes, like Cuba and Iraq, the countries you mentioned, are judges of human rights now at the United Nations. This is unacceptable, and our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, has said that that Canada is now back at the United Nations. Well, it's not enough just to be back. Canada has to take the lead, and that's why we were in Parliament couple months ago, ahead of these elections. And I was there with Professor Erwin Kotler and with NSF Haider and human rights victims from these countries, from Cuba, from China, also from Montreal, Wang Binjang, his daughter, Tiana, is a law student at McGill. She was with us in Ottawa, and we called on Canada to take the lead in opposing dictatorships like China, like Cuba, like Saudi Arabia, at the Human Rights Council. Unfortunately, uh, the Trudeau government didn't say a word in opposition to these countries. Now, they're, they're not alone. The United States Ambassador Samantha Power didn't say a word. The EU countries, the UK, France, Germany, didn't say a word. So how can we expect the United Nations to improve when our leading democracies fail to step up to the plate? That's the situation today. Hello, Neuer joins us from UN Watch. Why is the UN so ineffective lately, especially on issues of, of human rights? And, and is there a reform that is possible to, to improve things? Well, it it really begins with whether our own democracies will take the lead and speak out. And on some occasions, they do. Look, at the General Assembly, Canada uh, once again led a resolution on Iran a month ago to criticize their human rights record. On the other hand, they included, I think it was five or seven paragraphs of praise for the regime uh, in in the preambular section. 
So that's an example where, and it wasn't Canada doing it alone, they led the resolution, but of course they did it in concert with the United States and the European Union. But if the leading democracies can't run a resolution on Iran without including uh, seven false paragraphs of praise as basically appeasement in connection with the nuclear deal, then what hope can we have for the rest of, of the countries of the United Nations who are far less enlightened? So I, I think it's, it's really up to us and really up to our representatives. We have to demand from our members of parliament, from our elected representatives, that they speak out at the United Nations. If, if they don't do it, nobody else will. You quote uh, the document that is Saudi Arabia's candidacy for the, the Human Rights Council chair, and they say that Saudi Arabia supports empowerment of women and guarantees fair gender equality. Of course, women can't drive, among other uh, very uh, abusive policies. Uh, what, what should, how should a UN react to a country like Saudi Arabia? Do you exclude them from the UN and from these commissions, uh, or do you try to engage them in some sort of dialogue? Well, one of the arguments at the Human Rights Council, I would say by apologists uh, for, for the fact that, that abusers get elected time and again, is to say, well, we, we need to include uh, some of the worst countries, uh, some, of the, some of the worst regimes, because we want to keep them inside the tent. We don't want to alienate them. We want to have a constructive dialogue. Well, let, let's, let's unpack that. Uh, the, the first thing is to examine the record. The fact is that in the past 10 years of the Human Rights Council, which just marked its 10th anniversary, uh, we've, we've seen the election of some of the world's worst regimes, Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, Cuba. They've all been elected, Venezuela, over the past 10 years. I haven't met one person in Geneva, where I'm based, who could name for me a single act of reform progress that was achieved by electing these tyrannies to the Human Rights Council. On the contrary, the first thing the tyrannies do when they're elected is use their election as propaganda. Indeed, it's in Canada. The Saudi ambassador, who was asked, I think it was Embassy, Embassy Magazine in Ottawa, was asked, you know, why should Canada be selling military uh, weaponry or jeeps to, to, to your country, given your human rights record. He said, but no, don't you know, Saudi Arabia has been elected a member of the UN, UN Human Rights Council. So unelected and, and dictatorial regimes use these elections as a false badge of international legitimacy. And there's not a shred of evidence that any of these regimes has improved by their election to the Human Rights Council. Again, I just mentioned Russia. Russia was elected in 2013. In the three years since then, they embarked on perhaps the most aggressive uh, period in, in modern Russian history since, since the USSR uh, collapsed uh, two decades ago. So there's no evidence of that. And, and what, what I would tell apologists is that uh, it's, it's, not, it's not me or my organization, UN Watch, which is saying that we need to elect decent countries and not dictatorships. It's the United Nations itself. When the old Human Rights Commission was scrapped in 2006 and replaced with the UN Human Rights Council, the founding resolution of March 2006 Resolution 60-251 in paragraph 8 says specifically countries that get elected uh, have to be judged by their record in promoting and protecting human rights. Members are obliged to uphold the highest standards. Those who don't uphold standards, who commit gross and systematic abuses, can be removed by a two-thirds vote. So the notion of choosing decent regimes and not choosing the worst, most vicious misogynistic, anti-gay regimes is enshrined by the UN itself. But the problem is, is that too many UN diplomats, and I would say some NGOs, like the folks at Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which have gotten too close to the UN and in some cases have become apologists for the UN because they often end up working for the UN, they'll quickly say, well, you know, we need everybody there. But that's not what the UN itself uh, uh, decided in its founding resolution of the Human Rights Council. UN Watch Executive Director Hillel Neuer in Geneva, former Montrealer, and you can check out uh, their work at unwatch.org, and particularly the uh, top 20 UN Watch moments of 2016 has some uh, interesting information there. Uh, Mr. Neuer, thanks so much. My pleasure.